So hi everyone and, and welcome uh, as we join our communities together of Congregation Beth Tikva and Prince of Peace and people are still coming in. This is wonderful. I'd like for us to begin our time together by acknowledging who's here and taking a look and seeing the faces of those with whom we're coming together into community with today across religious tradition, from our various homes, all connected through service to the Holy Blessed One and all connected through our, the intimacy and in, in the relationship between our, our, our communities. So I'm gonna lead us in a blessing to begin. This blessing extends gratitude to God for being the one who has kept us alive and sustained us and enlivened us and allowed us to reach this special moment of blessing. Baruch atarunai Eloheinu melech haolam, shehechianu v'kiyamanu v'hegianu lazman hazeh. Amen. Translation is, praised are you, Adonai, our God, ruler of time and space, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this moment right now. So it's with great joy that uh, Pastor Brett and I enter into this conversation. I want to acknowledge uh, the president, uh, excuse me, the, the mayor of Eastroom Township who just entered, Mayor Vizi. Um, so nice of you to spend a couple minutes with us and so good to see you. I know um, in Eastroom Township, you guys have been uh, working really, really hard to keep services going and to um, be thinking about schools and all the different things that you're doing. And um, just an honor to have, to have you with us. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Um, great. Uh, so this came about uh, through Pastor Brett and my friendship, and he reached out and said, hey, do you want to have a conversation and a check-in? And, and here we are. Um, so this is meant to be informal and, uh, and, and, and just check in, checking in on each other and each other's communities. So um, Pastor Brett, how are you? Today, um, I am, uh, I'm well, I'm well. A little bit, um, you know, uh, uh, experiencing some fatigue uh, from time to time. Um, that's a different kind of fatigue that I'm used to. <laughs> um, you know, kind of um, doing traditional things that we do, but doing them in a new way um, requires energy, um, requires emotional stamina. Um, and, uh, but, uh, overall I'm good. Um, you know, for me, this particular time has, um, been filled with frustration, uh, and, um, times of even anger, um, at, uh, you know, not being able to control what we can't control, <laughs> you know, and having to let, let that go. Um, but also there's been lots of blessings, um, in, in the sense of um, opportunities that have arisen because of the way we need to do things um, that have provided me with opportunity to grow personally. So um, various things with regard to my health have improved greatly during this time um, from an exercise regime to um, uh, eating much differently than, not much, but uh, fairly differently than I ate before um, and uh, seeing all kinds of uh, benefits from those things, as well as uh, uh, changing a structure to my day. Um, and so uh, one of the things that um, I've taken on, and I've always kind of wanted to do this little secret, um, I've always wanted to be a monk. <laughs> um, uh, even since I was a little kid, I used to kind of fantasize about that. And I didn't, the Lutherans really don't, we don't do that. That's not kind of our thing. <laughs> Um, but I've always fantasized about community 
And but another component of certain types of monastic living is um, stability, not just in location, um, but in schedule. And so um, I have really during this time um, have often talked about schedule and that sort of thing, but I've been keeping more of a monastic kind of schedule up before the sun um, to bed when the sun goes down uh, or soon thereafter. Um, and it has made huge differences um, just in giving me space for me, space with relationship with God. Um, and uh, I, I just feel like a, a buttressing. Uh, so in that area of my life, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very well. Um, and uh, so anyway, um, how is, how are you, Nathan? Thank you. I'm, I'm good. There's so much to respond to in, in what you said. I just, I, I uh, but thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. You know, it's been uh, a really interesting number of months and I, and I'm, I'm feeling the similar new type of exhaustion <laughs> that is new. I, I, it's a it's 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 like an emotional and sort of creative exhaustion that like I sometimes I feel like I don't have any more bandwidth to be able to think creatively about huh. something that needs my immediate attention and sort of holding like what that like, give me something tangible and like sure we're just gonna like I can book a meeting I can work <laughs> with a bar mitzvah student like that that I can figure out but there is some of these big sort of anxiety producing things that are causing just like right now it's it's all about Hebrew school and 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 what does that look like and just when I think about it I wanna sort of shiver in the <laughs> I can't and I know you guys just did a really creative vacation Bible school we did uh, which I imagine took a lot of a uh, group effort of really creative thinkers to to make happen in that way and where i met with our education director maura meyer this morning and we were thinking about okay like what is this what does this look like but anyway that's professional like personally i'm do, i'm fine i i'm i'm really blessed in that like we say juicy you know kanahara you know god forbid um everyone in mine and sam's families are good and we both have our jobs and so like we're not worrying about our next meal and and we're not um, dealing with major health issues. So like toy toy, it should, it should stay that way. And then we're gonna, I, I get to do this, this work, um, which just feels really real at, at, at this moment. So um, yeah. Oh, and just wrote in the comments that I've been running. Yeah, I ran four miles this morning. I've been running almost every morning and um, it, you know, Brett, you talked about exercising differently. Um, this is, for me, I've been a gym rat since I was, you know, 26, uh, with 25, 26 with varying levels of regularity, <laughs> but, um, and to not have access to that caused me to sort of rethink. And now I'm having this like time of meditation in the morning when I'm going out on my runs and I'm, I'm, coming to really appreciate appreciate that. I'm nervous for when it gets cold because of it, but that's that's how I'm doing. Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, so we did have a really great vacation Bible school. We called it uh, V2, Virtual Vacation Bible School. And we did it all in this platform. Um, well, in conjunction with some resources to do outside the platform, so. It, um, we probably had more meetings for this Vacation Bible School than we've had for all the Vacation Bible Schools for the last four years combined. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, but it really paid off. There, everyone, it just went so much more swimmingly than we had um, even anticipated. So we had a breakout into breakout rooms by actual classroom. <laughs> Um, and people went to their specific classroom based on age with teachers, you know, for that age group. Um, so, 
Uh, we have one of our young people is getting ready. Well, he's doing virtual college now, but um, he did all the tech stuff for us behind the scenes. Um, so uh, we didn't have to worry about that. And, and he did a great job. So did you guys, can I ask, did you see any drop off in numbers from like the beginning of the week to the end of the week? So always, I mean, whether we have it in person or we have it live, it's always when we have a, our vacation Bible school week long program, it always, there is always a drop off by the end of the week. Um, it just the way it is. Um, and so, and here in this venue we did, but not much. So we had um, uh, 30 students and um, nine or 10 teachers, something like that. And um, uh, I think uh, the last day we had 37 students. So it wasn't a huge. Wow. But it was cool. Some of our kids were came to vacation Bible school while they were away on vacation at the beach. You know, whatever. I'm not sure what their vacation looked like, but they were at the beach and this is, they chose to connect and be with us during that time. So. Do they want to join the synagogue? <laughs> <That's a> good... <laughs> well, I say that because we've been doing uh, what we've been calling Mitzvah Mondays. And it was geared towards families with really small children, um, two through six-ish. Uh, it's actually it was three through nine is what it was. But and we had 20-something kids sign up. And as the weeks, and each week we Zoom for 20 minutes and do um, this interactive, you know, we sing a song, we teach about a specific mitzvah, we give them ways to do that with their families during the week, and then we send them on their way. Our, our, Mora Meyer tells a story. Um, and it's 20 minutes long and away they go. And our numbers have just been, each week been trickling off. And we, so we've called some of the families and they've said, it was a it's a great idea. We just don't want any more Zoom for yeah. our kids. Like they can't, they can't do it. And so we're sort of figuring, trying to figure out, well, what does youth engagement look like when you can't meet in person, kids have varying needs. And it's, it's just a real live question because as I'm sure you would say about um, your faith in Christianity, you know, Judaism is tailor-made to speak to your lived experience and to be a, a, a wellspring of, of meaning and community during times of trouble. Yet, sort of translating that to a way that children are able to receive it in this environment and to feel that just has been like, for me, that's like my sacred challenge du jour yeah. of, of the day of how, to, of how to do that. And it's, it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's been our practice typically in the summertime to pause education for families. And we chose to this summer to do that as well. Um, and just because we knew people were kind of zoomed out and uh, and now that looks like, you know, it's more online learning for the fall. <laughs> um, we were actually having a meeting coming up um, to uh, begin looking at what we might do in the fall. Um, and our practice actually, interestingly enough, our, we call it discipleship practice, formerly Sunday school, but it's a, a way of helping train parents and children at the same time about specific spiritual practices or mitzvahs, you can, you know, um, as practices, but to, to do uh, over, you know, the, the next week. Um, to give them a toolbox of, uh, you know, various practices. So I've been contemplating, and this is new, and I haven't nailed all this out, but um, how might we do something outdoors with um, families or children um, in smaller groups um, in a still physically distanced way, um, but, uh, you know, and uh, I don't have an answer for that yet, but I've been just kind of thinking about you know, child-led, child-centered, almost forest school, you know, Scandinavian or Germany, you know, forest school approach of immersing in the creation for a period of time on a regular basis, but in a safe, physically distanced way. And um, we have our safety team meets on Sunday, so I'm hoping to have that, some more ideas around that and, and talk with some of the nurses and doctors in that group and see what their thoughts are, but. Yeah. 
So just, I just, I don't know, you know, it's, it's, um, and how can we do it, you know, if people are, are screened out, um, you know, well, there's a new research out I've been reading recently about how any, every time we see a screen, it zaps a kind of certain part of our energy, um, you know, mm -hmm. kind of exhausts us, you know, um, and so it might be some of it is tra retraining us all how we use technology and when we don't use it. Um, for me to keep my schedule that I've been keeping, you know, uh, I have to be done with technology before 8 p.m., <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. and I don't turn it back on typically till after nine, but sometimes I, I need to do it before then in the morning. But uh, anyway. I am... Uh... That's, that's optimistic. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, there's this, this piece about how you practically do the work of pastoring or rabbiing or ministering, whatever you, whatever the right word is, but there's also the sort of spiritual piece of trying to find where holiness resides in all this. And I guess, you know, I'm curious to hear from you, like, how you're experiencing God in this moment, and like, what, what's going on for you theologically? Because, I, frankly, I, I'm, a, I'm like a scatterbrain with this question. You know, if you turn it around to me, I'm like scared. I'm asking you, but I'm a little scared for you to turn around on me because, <laughs> like... We don't have to do that. <laughs> we, we, we can. It's like it's going to force me to really address it because, you know, the, 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 this idea of, like... And, and Jews are no stranger to this question, that like when there's so much suffering, where, where is God? Um, and it just feels really pointed for this, for this time. I'm curious, sort of like where in, in your spiritual life. Yeah. Um, be before I answer that, I just want to respond to, um, uh, Anne made a little comment down here, um, based on what we were just talking about. I hear it's partially because you're seeing yourself in Zoom, some way to be done. The teacher is seen, but not the kids. Uh, for shorter moments. Actually, there is a way that you cannot see yourself. Um, if you can hide yourself, if you look at your little picture and there's little three dots up in the corner and you click on that, there's something called hide self view. You can make yourself go away so you don't have to see yourself. <laughs> um, some people that is an issue, um, not issue, a, a challenge uh, to kind of continue to see themselves. Um, and so you can see all the other people, but you just can't see yourself. Um, and you can turn that back on as well. Um, but uh, that's helpful for some, but I hear that's definitely an issue. Um, yes, there is a sense of definitely longing to be together um, in person. Um, you know, and, and uh, I'm still holding your question in my heart, but I, one thing that comes to my mind, several people have talked about, you know, I would share with them, you know, what are you doing to rejuvenate yourself, to be restorative, to do that? Say, well, I normally would do this. I normally would do this. I normally do this. And they give me this like, long list of things they can't do anymore. And, and I'm like, okay, you can focus on that. So let's, when you do focus on that, tell me from that experience. So getting out for dinner, you know, with your spouse, what about that is restorative? What exactly about that is restorative? So I remember someone telling me, well, it's we get out of the house um, and we have someone else's food. I'm like, okay, is that all that's restorative? Yeah, pretty much. Okay, so how can you get those things, but in a different way? You know, can you pick up food some from somewhere and then take your card table and set it up outside? <laughs> you know, you're welcome to come around Prince of Peace and pull around in our back lawn and set up a chair and a table and have your dinner with your spouse. Um, you know, if, if that's, you know, to just a change of venue. So I'm just inviting creativity. So for me, to answer your question, that's actually been um, a part of wrestling with, um, personally, with um, the divine during this time, is um, kind of always where is um, God in beauty? 
that's always been a, a thing for me that when I'm having trouble seeing or if I'm depressed uh, or whatever, and I always encourage other people, look for the beauty. Where do we see the beauty, whether it's in people or things or creation, art, music, um, look for uh, the beauty. And uh, so theologically, uh, for me, a lot lately has been really grounded more and more in the rhythms of the earth, um, the rhythms of the day, the rhythms of the season, and trying to kind of touch with that. And I have this little book, um, actually it's called Celtic Benediction. Um, the author, actually I read a prayer from the same author um, at the uh, event that we had, that you had um, in response to the uh, violence in Pittsburgh um, from this particular author, J. Philip Newell. But he just kind of keeps reminding me to look at the patterns of the earth. And, and the, the earth and its original goodness that is God created is just keeps springing forth life. It just, it just is um, always inching towards life. I took a picture the other day of a tree that was growing. I live in Philadelphia, a tree that was growing from the crack out of the side of a building. And the tree must have been six feet tall from this crack. I mean, you know, it, life wants to come out from all kinds of places. Um, and, and so for me is just kind of keep looking for where is life, you know, yearning to come out. Um, and where do I see that? Um, and how can I recognize it? Um, and then with that also, um, part of the cycles and seasons is pain. You know, um, I've not experienced the pain of childbirth. Um, and I bless all of you that have, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, there is something about um, what is born from struggle, what is born from darkness, what is born from pain, um, and, uh, uh, and, and recognizing for me in this struggle, what's being born anew, um, I use a Christian phrase, born again, um, not like our fundamentalist friends use it, but, um, you know, how is it being re-grasped, grasped? again and again. Um, mm. I don't know if that's that's helpful, but that's, I could go on, but uh, I won't um, at the moment, but you know, kind of been helpful for me. No, that's really helpful. I, I, I'm glad that in the comments, Liz just sort of got the sound bite here, life yearning to come forth and sort of like in the cracks of the edifices that we build, if we pause and sort of let nature do its thing, life will spring forth. Um, it makes me, over the last couple of weeks, I've taken a number of um, conversion candidates to the mikvah. We've made, our community has uh, made three new Jews in the last uh, three weeks. And it's, yeah, I know, Semantavu, Mazel Tov. It's uh, a really powerful thing for people going through that process to enter into the mikvah waters, which are that are by necessity naturally flowing. There's a like a rainwater collection that brings the water into a cistern, and it has to be a certain level of natural uh, flowing waters because you you do that. You connect with this natural element to be born anew and there's something quite beautiful and really in that and in other life cycle events as i'm thinking about it those have been really powerful touchstone moments for me of of sensing god's presence and being able to you know having our uh you do interviews before people uh, go through conversion and you need three rabbis and those are happening over zoom which is like wild, whoever thought that that's what would be what we're doing. Um, but to go and to bear witness to these people having transformative moments in, in this way is, is, is really sensing God's presence. We've had um, a couple of B'nai Mitzvah, bar and bat mitzvahs in our community, and they've just been incredible. Um, there's been a, uh, we just had a, 
we just had a, a, a bris in our community and sort of being with people and acknowledging that even though there's so much strife and challenge in the world that the natural flow of things continues to move. I just, just reflecting on what you said, it's, it's, it's really beautiful and, and, and powerful, this idea of life yearning to, to come forth. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, this, that suffering and pain is a part of, is a part of life and doing that work of trying in this environment to accompany people as best as I can and, and be a companion for them through this um, feels really sacred. I, yeah, and, 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 and God's really there, you know, even in our virtual worship, which I admit for me, I mentioned this last week, I had a Zona call with Rabbi David and I talked a little bit about this, that it's not, it doesn't have the same feeling for me as a Jew that I, that I want it to, because I really experience God in the spaces in between. And I think with me sort of far away from other people who are, I guess, similarly distanced from one another, I feel a bit more distanced. So like that connection isn't there when leading services over Zoom, leading worship over Zoom. But so I'm, I'm but I know that for so many congregants, the, the seeing of the bima and seeing the ark and the, and the Torah scrolls and um, participating in services has been really, for many, they've expressed to me that it's been really moving and, and important and, and, and powerful. Um, so I, I, I feel God's presence there, but for me spiritually, like Nathan the guy, um, it's more challenging. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, there's some nice uh, affirmation of you there, Nathan. Um, and uh, it, it is a, a gap. <laughs> it is a, a different thing. And so, um, you know, so we've been doing, uh, I do a message ahead of time and people have the opportunity to listen to it. Um, and uh, so some people, that's their connection with the community during the week others will come to bible study but don't come to zoom worship um you know others will come you know they kind of have a whole host of different things some their primary form of worship right now is working in our food pantry um and um would i like to see them more in tech study perhaps yeah but do i um know but i don't know exactly what they're doing at home and okay so whatever um uh, you know, but, uh, but our Zoom time is we, our musician plays and we sing at home, everyone muted, but you sing by yourself, but that's not the same as communal singing, <laughs> you know, is, uh, it's not the same. Uh, you know, we also engage uh, and we have a conversation about the text, which is not typical for our worship. So that is wonderful for some people and like off-putting to others. They really don't want to care. They don't really care what their neighbor has to say about the text <laughs> or, you know, or, you know, sometimes people have different views of things and it makes people unco uncomfortable hearing someone else's view. You know, there's a whole host of things. Um, so it is different. Um, and trying to figure that out, you know, um, yeah. And some people just aren't interested. Um, the technology scares them, <laughs> you know, the, the, some certain folks in certain, demographics don't want to connect in this way. So we're actually uh, pondering our first kind of in-person outdoor worship experience later on this month, um, trying to consider that. Um, administration hasn't, our the council hasn't made the final determination on that yet, but again, the safety team meeting is this week and council meets this week as well. Um, so, um, but trying to figure out how we, you know, can do that in a safe way um, uh, with everyone it seems as if um, so. We're we're leaning that way at the moment. 
so hard. Yeah. I know, you know anytime there's any talk of like, how do we meet in person and what do we need to do? Like, I, <laughs> I feel like my head is, 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 is ready to burst into flames. I just like, I can't, I struggle to wrap my brain around how it can happen, particularly when, you know, there are so many in our community who maybe phys have physical vulnerabilities and I don't, want to be the one to say i'm sorry please don't come to this or or policing people's distance or even right. volunteers to be the ones to do it so we've we've taken a a really conservative approach that not everyone is thrilled with right um but you know at the end of the day i feel confident that nobody is going to get sick because of their participation at Beth Tikva. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying, I feel like it may be coming out like I'm questioning what you're thinking. That's not what I'm doing. No, 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 not at all. I'm just acknowledging sort of what our process has been and, and the way and trying to think about what we do and don't do. You know, we tried, um, and this gets to the next question where I wanted to go was like, a, how's your, what's, how's your congregation doing both like your congregants and the life and vitality of the congregation. But, um, we tried to do a, um, a Friday night uh, ice cream thing where people would drive through, would essentially throw a hoodsie cup at them and, uh, or a popsicle and away they would go. That was the idea. And that's not really <laughs> what happened because we had people there distributing them who wanted to say hi to one another. And then people came and then some people parked and got out of their cars. And, and this question of how do you police it? Um, and what do you, it, 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 it's, it's just hard, it's just hard. I, you know, we have vibrant congregants in their eighties and nineties and I don't know. I, and, and, and so that is, that is hard. We have been doing, We've had two so far. Um, uh, the only in-person gathering we've had so far is a, a coffee hour um, on a Saturday morning outside, socially distanced, no use of bathrooms. Um, you have to take care of business beforehand. <laughs> um, and some people that became the barrier. Well, I, I that's not going to work for me. <laughs> so, you know, and they bring their own chair, uh, you know, and then we have masks. Everyone's masked and distanced and all of that. Um, and that's been helpful for some. For a couple, it was their first venture outside ever, <laughs> you know, because they've been having all the groceries delivered. Da, 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 da. Um, and so it is hard, you know, and, and, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, our vulnerable members. And the, always the question is, um, is it safe? You know, how do we keep it for, oh, we always keep the most vulnerable in mind. Um, and there's a certain sense of, um, I am, we're also not their parent. <laughs> Um, you know, having to let people make their own decision um, about their own health and well-being. Um, and that uh, is exhausting. <laughs> right. It's a totally, this, this major, this big push-pull yeah. of how, yeah, right? And, and also this, this idea that we're called congregations because we're places where people congregate. Yep. Right? Yep. And we have our main uh, worship space is called a sanctuary because yep. it's supposed to be that, a sanctuary. And if people can't enter the sanctuary to congregate, yeah. Right? I'm seeing I'm seeing someone cats going like this, right? Well, it's like, well then <laughs> and had it and I guess I've been constantly racking my brain to think, how do we, you know, there's this famous story um, after the destruction of the second temple that um, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai uh, uh, escapes out of Jerusalem in a casket um, to be, so that the Romans would let him out uh, so that he could uh, sort of rebuild Judaism after the sacrif sacrificial system comes to an end and we move to this system of prayer and mitzvot and building synagogues and things like that. Sort of this rabbinic Judaism that grew at that time. And like, it could have been 
done, but he was he he had the the foresight to say no, we're gonna reconstruct it for it to be alive for this moment because it it can be and it has to be. Um, so how do I feel like I'm living in history, and that 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 the my grandkids and great grandkids are going to look back and say, wow, that's what it was like before COVID. That's what you did. I couldn't imagine because of course we do it this way now and we've been doing it for so long. And then they're going to be upset when anything changes or you change a melody to a prayer that's been done that way for 40 years or something, something, something like that. You know, I just feel like we're in it. So recently um, one of the spiritual developments for me is um, I became a, um, a Lutheran Franciscan. Mazel tov, by the way. Thank I saw you. that. That's wonderful. And um, one of the things about St. Francis is that his, one of his encounters with God was to, um, to rebuild the church. Um, he took it literally at first because he had this revelation in a broken down chapel. <laughs> so he started to build it personally, but it really became a much larger thing. And I really think we're in this time of rebuilding. So you know, I took my vows into this group um, virtually. You know, normally there's a laying on of hands and the community gathers, but the community was gathered, but on this screen. <laughs> um, and so for me, it's like, how do we, it, it's become even more, um, how do we embrace our roots in Judaism in, in the sense of how do we help individuals be responsible for their own spiritual journey to know that there's a group but you know, what are you doing on, in your own space and how are we equipping one another in, in our spaces, in your own personal space to do your own journey um, as well as to know that there's others who are journeying with you um, in varieties of ways. So I, I definitely see it's, a, it's an, a whole new thing is here's our birth thing again, is being born, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, what it will look like and how it will take shape and how it will rise up, I, we don't know yet. <laughs> So in the Jewish tradition, after the destruction of the second temple and the altar being destroyed and um, the lack of sacrifices, the, the altar becomes your dining room table where the challah becomes symbolic of, of the sacrifice and you've brought it into your home. And I'm seeing comments both from Ben and Mickey about, um, creating that prayer space mm, mm. Um, and uh, just as a, as a forewarning to my Beth Tikva folks in I think a week or two I have an email set to go out uh, to the whole congregation about creating what's called a mikdash me'at a mini mikdash a mini altar a mini place for um, for worship that gives you 10 different uh, things to think about in creating your mindfully creating your prayer space and it's things like um hang on, i want to pull up uh pull up what i created here um to to choose your prayer space carefully in advance and and be mindful of it to say a blessing over that space and i give some suggestions thinking about the chair you sit on, um, the placement of your computer, um, putting meaningful objects there, um, you know, the clothing that you choose, but all the things that we do now that prayer has taken this space into our homes, making our homes, which really is like the religious tradition, I think in both of our, yeah faiths right that like it all is home centered and to give people this opportunity to really be mindful about what does it mean to like mamish like really really have a jewish home or have a spiritually engaged home and to have a prayer space in your home that's a gift yeah that right and so i showed a little picture i mean just at my little desk here here's just my prayer space on my desk you know, um, beautiful. And so we do that with, this is one of the spiritual practices that we do with our, our families 
is, you know, kind of teach them to create a space, you know, and, you know, maybe you put pictures or in that space of people who you're remembering in prayer, you know, um, uh, both living and deceased or whatever, you know, um, all kinds of things, you know, um, sometimes I'll put a picture of someone who I'm wrestling with um, or have great disdain for in that space to kind of keep reminding me to cultivate compassion. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, I think that's a great idea. Love to see the resource you send. I can, uh, you're a special guy. You can get the advanced copy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like, how are your congregants? How are you, how is it walking the journey um, with your congregants? How are people faring during all this? What are you seeing? Um, well, there's some here today, um, although I'm cautious not to speak for them. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, there's a whole range and most people are um, making the best of it. Most are um, exacerbated by this whole thing, you know, and just over it. <laughs> Um, you know, and we were kind of hoping that uh, things might be lightening up a little bit, that we might have a little more freedom now, and then maybe it tightened down again in the fall at some point or something, but no, none of that's really happening. And so there is a fatigue uh, amongst them. Uh, there's a sense of, you know, uh, you know, I just don't like Zoom worship, or I just don't like, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, our, uh, when we get um, frustrated, our, um, a little inner toddler comes out, you know, and, <laughs> um, you know, we, we, uh, I, I've had those moments, hopefully usually not in public, but, <laughs> um, but, you know, and people are sad. Um, people are afraid. Um, and, uh, and I, I keep trying to, you know, remind people when, you know, when, where, where are you finding the hope? Where are you seeing the beauty? You know, I, I just keep reminding myself, necessity is the mother of all invention. Um, and what is going to be from our previous topic, you know, uh, what is going to birth, birth the new, what's going to happen that, um, that will be revolutionary to um, how we carry on and live out our faith. I wish I knew the answer to that, but it, it's, it's emerging somewhere. Um, so, um, you know, and some are, you know, frustrated that, you know, that they think the congregation is too conservative in our approach. Um, some are thinking that, you know, even having the little in-person coffee hour thing is too risky. We shouldn't be doing that as irresponsible. <sighs> right. You know. Rabbi Nathan, do you have a church council like we do? or Because I just, I, I always feel like Brett doesn't make decisions alone. That he has a whole team that, not to take the blame, but that it's a, it's not just you have too much on your plate you can't make all these decisions as no we, father of a yeah we have a we have a board and mm -hmm. i have to say uh i'm really speaking of the health and vitality of the congregation i think that beth tikva through covid has become a better functioning organization mm -hmm. um in that it's really been incredible to see what started to happen was all the vice presidents um, and I know Renee was a vice, she, she was one of the vice presidents and then moved on to do other things, but was in the early part of this and sort of setting this tone. I'm seeing if there are any other vice presidents uh, here, but there, um, the, um, one of our immediate past president, Rachel Kramer, and all the vice presidents and uh, our administrator, um, Ilana and I started meeting every week. Um, to be able to address sort of critical needs as they came up and to make decisions and to put out information about decisions and things like that, in addition to our monthly board meetings. And so having that regularity of synagogue leadership coming together, thinking about things on a rolling basis, I think has served us as a synagogue really well. And um, our synagogue picked up a half a dozen new members over the last couple of months and our worship numbers are up and it's kind of remarkable. I think our small size really helped us and we um, pivoted really quickly and got this leadership team um, together really quickly and have been able to do 
to function in a bigger way. And, and, and the decisions aren't on me. You know, sometimes, as I'm sure this happens in the church too, some things you want to put on your spiritual leader because they're making the, a place of like moral leadership, decision-making, things like that. And some things you want it to be lay people in order to protect the, 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 the rabbi or the pastor or something like that. And our, our, our crew, I think, has done a, a really good job of, of, of getting out there and, and yeah. 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 Cool. So, so I uh, want to just say too, that I think it's really exciting that um, the, how are my people? They're super excited about the ministry that we are doing. So, you know, the, the BBS went really well. We've got this food pantry, you know, that we've, um, we're serving now a hundred and uh, every week between a hundred and 150 people a week. Um, and uh, then with the summer meals program. So with, this is a collaborative. We're actually working on the process of thinking about a, a changing the name. So because you guys are involved, as well as um, St. Joan of Arc, Christ the Presbyterian, um, all participate and others in you know, how we might, um, that the name would reflect of more of the co cooperative approach um, to the food pantry. Um, you know, we've received over $30,000 in donations in cash for the food pantry. Um, that's not including um, donations of in kind, which have probably at least $20,000 in kind. Um, and so it's just really um, just the blessings and the, our congregation has been extremely, I mean, you know, all the bills have been paid and their regular giving is just, you know, um, the stewardship, regular stewardship has not been an issue either. We've been so blessed with that. Um, so people are, you know, stepping up and, and continuing to serve um, uh, in the world. Uh, so I'm thankful for our partnership in that endeavor. Can I say a word about this? It's Please. been really... Um, people have heard me carry on about how much th the work that comes out of Prince of Peace and the social, the social justice work that you guys do um, really has been inspirational to me and, and, and my rabbinate and to many of my congregants and, and having this partnership and being able to not need to reinvent the wheel, but to say that Prince of Peace is, is spearheading this and it's our obligation to support them and what they do and to come together around this is is uh, really wonderful. And even when, you know, I know Mayor Vizi is here to say that like that, that, that the Catholic Church and uh, the Presbyterian Church and that uh, we're all coming together around this to serve uh, issues of food insecurity in Evesham Township in a collaborative way. Um, it's just, you've gifted us an opportunity to do a mitzvah um, in, in, in a big way. And um, Ann Wolf is here too from Beth Tikva. And um, Ann, uh, early on in this, took on a leadership role of working with the Jewish Federation and also the township and um, thinking about what are all the resources that are available. And we were putting out every couple of weeks messages to our congregants of, if you need this, if you, if you have that, you know, here are the things to do. And um, we, you know, it was very important that our congregants knew to support this food pantry at Prince of Peace as, as, as part of that. So, um, and it just serves our community so well. Well, and just want to say, especially with the mayor here, that the township has also been an integral part um, I forget who the liaison is from the township, but the township has done varieties of drives within the township that have brought in food in kind um, to us as well. Um, and uh, someone at Wiley connects us, hooks us up with some fresh produce um, in abundance from time to time as well. So um, it's definitely a community pantry. I mean, so that's probably gonna be a community food bank or whatever we're still working on possible names, but um, that we need to reflect the, the cooperative nature of what's happening. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's really great. And I see some of the leaders uh, from Prince of Peace here who've been working on this and it's uh, a great thing. Um, 
So one okay. of the questions that I posed to our staff this week, because we we were supposed to go on retreat next week to plan our calendar. <laughs> we normally do it two months ago, um, but uh, we're, we're like, well, I'm not sure how to plan. <laughs> but one of the questions I posed to them is, and so I offer it for you, um, being realistic, what would you like the life at Prince of Peace to look like by December 1st? You know, um, knowing all the, all kinds of variables can change, but what would be some of the things that no matter what variables change, what are some of the things that we would want to make sure are, are so, are happening? Mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at the most important things. So um, that's kind of a question I posed to the, the, um, the, the leadership of um, the staff. I'm posing it to the council here, getting ready for our council meeting. Um, but uh, I, I throw that to you, kind of what, what would, you know, what could Bet Tikva look like? What would be the, what might be the best thing that Bet Tikva could look like? What were the qualities that it would um, hold, embody, um, you know, three months from now? Um, and then how do we get there? <laughs> Thank you. I, it's such a, such a challenging question and such an, <laughs> but such a baseline important one. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know I just want it all to be, di you know, different. You know, we were for VBS, I walked into the sanctuary to get our sacred text and take it back to the room where I was going to do, you know, have it as a, you know, in the background. And I just stood there at the altar and cried and wept, <laughs> you know, because we haven't been gathered around that altar and haven't had communion, um, you know, in six months. Um, How does that on that, you know, to not have communion as a Christian, I, I, as, as a Jewish person, I always imagine that for Christians, communion is really spiritual and powerful because like, it's like actual communion um, with, with the holy. And I, I don't know, I don't want to say, I, I feel your pain, I guess. I don't know how, the right <laughs> way to say it, but I can imagine that that is really a painful thing to, to be missing. And yeah, and how to just think about it, how is it, because it is food, um, and food's important, um, and how does one share food safely? I mean, you know, you all know, you pass the hollow, you rip the hollow off, and you take your piece, and you pass it, you know, you, you know, you, uh, at, you know, Shabbat service, right? I mean, it's, similar and uh, different but you know and so there's that whole there's all kinds of you know, theological discussions that I'm not going to get into here about how <laughs> it's done um, and there's controversies all over the church about it but um, um, so it's uh, you know but ultimately you know in, in history communion you know only a couple times a year traditionally Okay. You know, a long time ago, depending on because you lived out, you know, couldn't get to the church or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, it's again a new way of seeing things. And how are we having communion with our neighbor who we're handing a bag of food to? Mm -hmm. You know, there is we're connecting with the divine in that action. Um, you know, we are connecting with the divine. Um, even as we have the meal, whatever meal you have with yourself or with your family. Um, yeah, sure, it is different than, you know, the whole community. But on a level, it is the same. Um, so it's um, opening our minds. Uh, it reminds me, um, and I know we only have a couple minutes left, um, Reminds me of a, of a of a story in the in the Talmud of um, this rabbi Rabbi Chiyabar Abba, who gets sick, and Rabbi Yochanan is another one of the sages, and he goes to visit him, and he says to Rabbi Chiyabar Abba, um, "Are your sufferings precious to you?" And Rabbi Chiyabar Abba from his sick bed says, neither them nor their rewards. 
none of it. And Rabbi Yochanan says, give me your hand. And Rabbi Chia Bar Arba puts his hand in Rabbi Yochanan's hand and he is healed. And the reason I bring this story up is, you know, what Rabbi Yochanan does is he says to the person who's suffering, you know, tell me about your suffering, right? You know, enter into that conversation. Let me in and let's walk this journey together. And it's when, and, and Rabbi Chia Bar Abba expresses grief about his suffering. He's like, I don't like it. No good's going to come from it. Neither this nor its reward. And then they, they hold hands and join the journey together. And then they find healing. So this idea that through joining hands together, even in the midst of all this suffering for which we feel that there may be no good to come out of it, we can find some healing. And that's what I'm hoping that this has been uh, for those bearing witness between you and me, Pastor, and then also what we, at least for me, what I hope my congregants are feeling um, in, in, in feeling that there's healing in not having to walk this journey of suffering alone, that we're, we're doing it together and in community with one another. Yes. Yeah. Not just in our own individual communities, but, you know, in a larger sense, too. Absolutely. Sure. So given the time, um, should we lead us in prayer, Pastor, to, to end Sure. Up? So I'm going to um, offer a prayer from uh, another book by the same guy who's been really helpful to me. And this book actually is, um, I'm going to give you a copy, Rabbi. Okay. Um, it's uh, specifically written um, for Jews and Christians uh, alike. Um, it has lots of great little uh, art in it. Um, Ooh. And uh, uh, but, uh, my soul. This is uh, a, a prayer for today, actually. And I thought the words were appropriate. In the gift of this new day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined, let me be thankful. Let me be attentive. Let me be open to what has never happened before. In the gift of this new day, in the gift of the present moment, in the gift of time and eternity intertwined. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Pastor Breath was beautiful. And um, once again, uh, just a word of gratitude to Mayor Vizi for, for taking time out of your day to be here and to, and to be with us. It means a lot. Um, and, for your, and for your service to the community and all that you're doing and trying to keep everybody safe. Um, thank you. Indeed. Indeed. And, uh, and thank you everyone for, for bearing witness to the conversation and uh, this will be saved. Pastor Brett will figure out what we're gonna do <laughs> with it from there. Uh, but once again, thanks everyone. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Yeah, thank you. All right. Good to see you. Thank you.